What's going on, y'all? Attorney Tom here. Today, we are reacting to the USCSB again. This time, we are reacting to the Deep Water Horizon. For anybody who doesn't know, the Deep Water Horizon was an offshore oil rig off of Louisiana in 2010. It exploded, killing a whole bunch of people, injuring more people, and causing one of the biggest environmental disasters in United States history. I myself was not a lawyer at that time, but I have a lot of colleagues who were part of this litigation. So I do know a fair amount. It's very interesting, but I'll pause the video and insert my points as they come up. Let's take a look. April 20th, 2010. 11 workers died and 17 were seriously injured by an explosion on the Deepwater Horizon, an offshore drilling rig located approximately 50 miles off the coast of Louisiana. The rig burned for two days, eventually sinking and triggering the largest oil spill in U.S. history as oil and gas spewed up from the sea floor. The Deepwater Horizon had been drilling an oil well in 5,000 feet of water in an area of the Gulf of Mexico known as the Macondo Prospect. In 2010, the CSB launched an investigation to examine the technical, organizational, and regulatory factors that contributed to the accident. During the investigation, the CSB made new findings about why a key piece of safety equipment the Deepwater Horizon's blowout preventer failed to seal the well during the emergency. These new findings help explain why the accident was so devastating. And the CSB cautioned that other blowout preventers currently in use could fail in similar ways. Okay, so right off the bat, the CSB identified the blowout preventer as the failing product that caused the incident. So my intuition says, product liability case but you have to look way deeper than that because you have to understand why the product failed did it fail because of faulty design did it fail because of faulty installation did it fail because of faulty maintenance and finally why was the blowout preventer in a position to fail in the first place in the real world when tragic incidents like this happen companies love to point the finger at each other so what i imagine happened is the owner of the Deepwater horizon blamed the manufacturer of the blowout preventer the manufacturer of the blowout preventer blamed the owner of the Deepwater horizon for creating a terrible situation that's just how it works remember in court fault is a spectrum given in percentages so it's not black and white there is never just one person at fault you can have hundreds of parties at fault let's keep going an offshore well involves creating a pathway between the drilling rig and oil and gas reservoirs trapped beneath the sea floor a deep hole or well bore is drilled through layers of subsea rock and sediment these rocky layers can contain trapped water crude oil and natural gas under pressure. An unplanned flow of these well fluids into the well bore, known in the industry as a kick, can be dangerous. Without careful management, a kick can lead to a blowout, the uncontrolled release of flammable oil and gas from the well. A blowout can be catastrophic, since oil and gas reaching the drilling rig can quickly find an ignition source, leading to a fire or explosion endangering the lives of the drilling crew. To prevent kicks, drillers pump a dense slurry called drilling mud into the well, creating a barrier between the undersea oil and gas and the piping that leads to the rig. If this mud barrier fails or is somehow removed, the safety of the drilling crew depends on a critical piece of equipment located on the sea floor called the blowout preventer, or BOP. The BOP is a complex electrically and hydraulically powered device that is essential for controlling the well and in an emergency situation, preventing a disaster on the platform high above on the sea surface. The BOP is connected to the rig by a large diameter pipe called a riser. If a kick occurs, the blowout preventer is designed to prevent flammable oil and gas from traveling up the riser to the drilling rig. This is done by sealing the area around the drill pipe, known as the annular space. 
To do this, the crew can manually close pipe rams and donut-shaped rubber devices known as annular preventers. If those devices should fail to work, the last resort is a pair of sharp metal blades which form a blind shear ram designed to cut the drill pipe and seal the well. The blind shear ram can be activated manually or by automated emergency systems. Okay, so now we know how the blowout preventer is supposed to work. Let's see what actually happened. At approximately 8.45 p.m. on April 20th, 2010, a kick occurred in the Macondo well. Oil and gas entered the well bore undetected, eventually passing above the blowout preventer and traveling quickly up the riser toward the deep water horizon and the 126 people on board. Just after 9.40 p.m., drilling mud, forced upwards by the rising oil and gas, suddenly blew out onto the rig. Crew members responded by closing the upper annular preventer in the BOP. However, this did not seal the well as intended, and flammable oil and gas continued to flow into the riser toward the rig. Next, the crew closed a pipe ram. This successfully closed the annular space and sealed the well. But tragically, this proved to be only a temporary fix. Oil and gas that were already above the pipe ram continued to flow inexorably toward the deep water horizon. As the oil and gas escaped the riser onto the rig, the pressure dropped in the annular space above the pipe ram. But at the same time, the pressure in the drill pipe climbed substantially. The drill pipe was closed at the top, but oil and gas continued to flow in from the reservoir below. After extensive analysis, the CSB concluded that this large difference in pressure likely caused the drill pipe to buckle, essentially bending the pipe off center. Did anybody catch what he said? The large difference in pressure, otherwise known as Delta P. For anybody who didn't watch my last video about Delta P, check it out. Center inside the blowout preventer. The buckling pushed sections of the drill pipe outside of the reach of the blind shear ram blades this would eventually prove to be catastrophic. Okay, so essentially the blowout occurred because of the huge pressure inside of the drill causing the pipe to buckle because the pipe buckled, it shifted. And because the pipe shifted, the final fail safe was unable to cut the pipe, meaning oil still continued to rise up, causing a huge explosion. So just based on what we have seen right now as a lawyer, I'm thinking of a potential design defect. So is it foreseeable that there will be a huge amount of pressure in a blowout preventer? And I would argue, yes, that's kind of the point of a blowout preventer. So when there is a large amount of pressure, the system shouldn't fail or it should be designed so it doesn't fail. But again, we don't know all the information. Was it installed correctly? Was this just a particularly weak pipe? Or was this just a crazy, abnormal, unforeseeable amount of pressure? Again, we don't have those answers just yet, but that's where my mind is going. At approximately 9.49 PM, the flammable hydrocarbons found an ignition source. And the first explosions shook the deep water horizon. With the drill pipe buckled, the explosion and subsequent loss of electrical and hydraulic power from the rig likely activated an automated system on the blowout preventer known as the AMF Dead Man, which closes the blind shear ram and cuts the drill pipe. This emergency system is designed to activate when electric power, hydraulic pressure, and communications from the rig have been lost. The AMF Dead Man system was operated by two redundant control systems on the BOP, known as the yellow pod and the blue pod. The redundancy is supposed to increase the reliability of the system in an emergency situation. The yellow and blue pods worked independently of each other and were comprised of identical enclosed computer systems and sets of solenoid valves. When activated, the solenoid valves controlled important BOP functions, such as closing the blind shear ram. If electrical power from the rig was lost, as happened on April 20th, 2010, both the yellow and blue control pods contained backup 27-volt 
and 9-volt batteries to power emergency functions. The 9-volt batteries powered computers that would activate the solenoid valves, which were powered by the 27-volt batteries. However, evidence indicates the blue pod had been miswired at some time before the BOP was lowered onto the seafloor. This caused the pod's 27-volt battery to drain and made it impossible to operate the solenoid valve for the blind shear ram on the night of the accident. This is very interesting. This could be a completely separate issue, a very important issue when you have a catastrophic event like the Deepwater Horizon, which, by the way, the litigation for this case and the damages for this case wasn't just limited to the people who were physically injured on board. This caused the greatest environmental disaster maybe ever in America, and it caused hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage to property, business interruption, the ocean, a whole bunch of up. So why that's important is this dead man switch failed. It was miswired. Why was it miswired? Okay, let's just say that the blowout preventer was the cause of the incident. The manufacturer of the blowout preventer says, okay, we will take responsibility for killing everybody on board. But once everybody was dead, the kill dead man switch should have cut off the valve as well. Therefore, it shouldn't have been an environmental disaster that it was. Therefore, we shouldn't be responsible for the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of damage caused to the environment, only the personal injury aspect. You see how this gets messy? Everybody just points fingers at one another because they don't wanna take responsibility. I wonder if they're gonna tell us why the blue pod was miswired. Let's keep going. And within the redundant yellow pod, the solenoid for the blind shear ram had been miswired. It spoke too soon. The yellow pod was also miswired. The solenoid valves were controlled by two coils of electrical wire. These two coils were designed to work in concert, generating a magnetic field strong enough to operate the valve. But within the miswired solenoid valve, the two coils actually opposed each other, leaving the valve paralyzed. Only a third unplanned failure allowed the yellow pod to operate. On the night of the accident, one of the nine volt batteries that powered the solenoid valve's computer had failed. As a result, the affected computer system could not initiate the command to energize the miswired coil. Had both coils of the miswired solenoid valve been energized, the two coils would have generated opposing forces on the valve. The solenoid valve would have remained closed and the blind shear ram would never have been closed. However, the failed battery rendered one coil inoperable and most likely allowed the other coil to open the solenoid valve by itself. This in turn initiated closure of the blind shear ram. This should have cut the drill pipe and sealed the well, greatly reducing the impact of the accident. But because the drill pipe was buckled and off center inside the blowout preventer, it was trapped and only. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Maybe I spoke too soon, but let me try to decipher what just went on here. Are they saying this? This might be like math. Hold on. I'm just scratching my head. Uh, they're saying that the blind shear ram activated because there were three things wrong with it. I don't know. I, I'm confused. All I know is now it's back to the differential pressure issue with respect to um, the pipe buckling. So the blind shear ram activated. Was it as strong as it would have normally been? I don't know. Um, but now we're back on the pipe buckling issue, which again goes more towards foreseeability and a potential design defect, at least in my initial thoughts. Because the drill pipe was buckled and off center inside the blowout preventer, it was trapped and only partially cut. With the failure of this last ditch measure, there was nothing left to stop the massive oil spill and the destruction of the rig. During its investigation, the CSB identified a mechanism that likely caused the drill pipe to be buckled around the time of the explosion. This mechanism is called effective compression. Although effective compression had previously been noted as a hazard in other drilling operations. That's important. 
Effective compression has been previously noted as a hazard, meaning that increases the foreseeability aspect of this. It had never been identified as a problem affecting drill pipe during well operations. Effective compression occurs because although pipe may appear to be perfectly straight, in fact, it has minute bends and irregularities invisible to the naked eye. Along these bends, the side of the pipe that is curved outward is slightly longer and has more surface area than the other side. When there is a large difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the pipe, as happened on April 20th, 2010, the longer side of the pipe experiences a larger bending force. Eventually, this force can become great enough to buckle even heavy pipe. This is an important finding, CSB investigators said, because the same conditions of differential pressure could occur at other drilling rigs. He said it, Delta P. And obviously note how he's identifying that this can happen in other situations as well. Even if a crew successfully shuts in a well. The CSB warned this could make existing blowout preventer designs less effective in emergency situations. In the case of the Deepwater Horizon accident, the buckled drill pipe prevented the blind shear ram from sealing the well. Oil and gas from the well flowed out of the buckled drill pipe and into the Gulf of Mexico for 87 days. A reported 5 million barrels of oil eventually spilled, causing one of the worst environmental disasters in United States history. So there we go. Now we know what happened to the Deepwater Horizon. And like I said, the litigation for this incident extended so much further than just the people who were injured on board because this was the largest environmental disaster in United States history. In fact, so many people were affected. I can almost promise you that the people watching this video in some way or another remember the incident or have some firsthand experience. So if you have first-hand experience for how the deep water horizon affected you leave your comments down below and the last thing i want to say before we wrap this up is the csb videos are great they're very technical but when you are doing these cases or working on these type of cases in real life you need to understand how you got to that point right now i'm working on a refinery explosion case and it's not just about the day of the explosion it's understanding how the individuals got to that point why the explosion happened why the structure or the environment was set up the way it was so i'm sure maybe if y'all are interested i can call i have a colleague who was instrumental in this litigation i think he even represented some of the families who were victims or who lost loved ones on the deep water horizon maybe we can go take a field trip and do an interview with him to understand more of that aspect all right, y'all, that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I think we just passed 407,000 subscribers. My goal is always to make content worthy of your time. Consider subscribing to this channel if you want to join this community. We're growing like crazy. We're having a lot of fun doing it. And um, talk to you guys later. Bye.